All right, guys, I guess we'll get this started. Um, thank you for coming to UX is more than a buzzword. Um, it's going to be quite a lot of content to get through. Um, there's a lot to do with UX. Um, and yeah, we've got a lot to go through. It's very high level. Um, but I'm hoping it covers a lot of topics. And hopefully, you guys learn something. Hopefully, I learned something from you. So let's get this started. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Callum, and I work as a user experience and interface designer at Doghouse in Perth, Western Australia. Um, not that it really matters. I have a Bachelor of Science in Digital Media to prove I know what I'm talking about, kind of. Um, and that's my Twitter, LinkedIn, and email, so feel free to get in contact with me. So to get the boring stuff out of the way, UX stands for user experience quite obviously. Um, and this definition here is, I think, brilliant. Um, it comes from the Oxford Journals. And it says, user experience design, UXD or UED, is the process of enhancing user satisfac satisfaction by improving the usability, ease of use, and pleasure provided interaction between the user and the product. And I think that perfectly sums it up. Um, it's important. Um, I don't think a lot of focus has been on UX until fairly recently. Um, and yeah, it's, I, yeah, I think it's super important. It's really interesting. Um, so story time. I, um, I was traveling with a mate of mine, one of my best mates from high school, and we were traveling across the Nullarbor and about halfway across, we were going from Perth to Brisbane, and about halfway across the Nullarbor, um, I ran out of data on my mobile phone. So I went to the mobile Optus site, which was an experience. And um, I went to go purchase a data pack. And so I finally navigate all my way through it. And I get to the end. Um, and I go to press the purchase button. And the purchase button is broken on mobile. So I mean, you can kind of understand here that like, it, it's, it's absolutely insane that a company of that size on mobile, um, that they're losing sales, all because of this little I guess it, it was a styling issue because I, I flipped the orientation of my mobile. It went to a different breakpoint and the button was fixed. So you can imagine how many sales they're losing just from little things like that. Um, and there's an example of it. <laughs> so uh, the term user experience designer. Um, it's a bit of a funny job title, actually, um, because you can't actually design a user's experience. It's impossible. Um, to get into, inside the inner workings of each individual to provide them the experience that they require is impossible. But the one thing that we try to do as, you, as user experience designers is design for the user experience. So using tried and tested methods of um, designs, stuff that we know that works well, try to get inside the user's head, do as much testing as possible to give them the best user experience that's possible. Um, but to actually design a user experience is impossible. You have to design for the user experience. Um, and that little graphic there to the right um, perfectly sums up all the things that we try to do as user experience designers. So uh, it needs to be useful, desirable, accessible, credible, findable, and valuable. Um, this is a bit of a hot topic. Um, the, there's a bit of a debate between, I guess, UX designers and user interface designers coming together and under one banner. Um, so can a, can a UX designer design interfaces? I think so. I think the two go hand in hand pretty well. Um, However, um, depending on the size of your agency, um, it's quite, if you're a smaller agency um, and you've got a UX designer who can also design interfaces, I think that's great. Um, however, if there are the time and resources and money to provide a separate user interface designer and a separate user experience designer, then that's probably the way to go as well. Um, but yeah, it's quite interesting. It's a bit of a debatable subject, which we won't get too far into today. Um, so user-centered design is the backbone of uh, UX. 
Um, basically, we're considering the user at every stage of the design process. They are our main focus. Um, we want to know who is using it, how they're using it, and why they're using it. Um, they're the three main questions that we want to try and figure out before we even touch wireframing. Um, it's the old saying, research, design, if it fails at usability testing, research again, and just keep doing it over and over until you get it right. Um, and then there's this interesting, I find it interesting at least, um, it's called the path of least resistance. Um, so I managed to snap this pretty cool picture on the plane uh, coming from Perth to, to here on Wednesday night. And obviously this is a much, much larger scale, but um, if I just zoom in a little bit, we can kind of see here that we've got this section of farmland. And then the path of least resistance is all about the user trying to get from A to B as quickly as possible. Um, and that's what UX is. We don't want to put hurdles in the way. I mean, that can hurt sales. It can hurt generating inquiry. It can hurt a whole bunch of things. So what's quite funny with this is that if we look closely, if I go back, you can see a little man-made path being made right across that corner angle. And this is known as the desire line. So you may have seen it before where you've seen a really curvy bike track with grass in between, and then there's bike tracks going over the grass. Um, it's just like, why would I go around this complicated pathway slowing down when I could just cut straight across? Um, and I find it super fascinating. I was actually quite happy I got that picture. But, you know. <laughs> so, planning. Um, basically, you need to plan as much as possible before, before even thinking about wireframes. Um, you need to figure out what's the best way to gather all of these requirements. Um, is the client providing a brief? Sometimes they don't. A lot of the time they don't. Um, and it's our jobs to basically extract that information from them. Um, another thing also that we want to plan is we want to know how much time to dedicate to different meetings, um, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and how much budget are we working with? Is this a brand new site? Um, is the budget large? Is it small? Or are we making tweaks to an existing site? Are there different things that we can remove to save money, <clears throat> but still try and provide a great user experience. So this is all, I guess, yeah, the planning stage. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to have a great kickoff meeting. Um, I think you should involve the designers and devs from the very start. Um, often you can get into the situation where um, a designer and a developer will be lumped with a dodgy handover after three workshops. Um, and it's very, very hard to try and explain to them months and months of work um, in a small meeting. And then, you know, then you piss off the developers, um, and they're always pissed off. So, in, yeah, involve the designers and devs from the very start, and they can give great insight in the meetings. Um, basically, you want to learn about the business and the users in the meeting. Um, it's pretty obvious, but, yeah, basically the business, they're going to know their users the best. And then it's up to us to provide tests and try and learn it better than their own business. Um, for the kickoff meeting, you don't want to get too far into business and user requirements. It's basically an introduction um, to the business. Um, so yeah, stay on topic, and it's very easy to get sidetracked. Um, <clears throat> gathering requirements. So basically, to do this, you're going to want to run a requirements workshop. Um, these are great for discussing business requirements, um, must-have features, um, finding information about the users, creating user journeys with the client, and also creating personas, which are fake profiles, and I'll talk about them in a bit. Um, and a big thing as well is that you want to know about their competitors. Um, there's a lot of things that you can learn from their competitors and other people in the market. They might be doing things better, they might be doing things worse. And it's great. I mean, they've most likely already done the research. It's sitting there. You just need to look at it and take what you want from it. Um, and also, if they do happen to have an existing product, run through it and find out what's wrong with it before trying to fix it. Um, contextual research is huge. Um, it's kind of skipped over a bit, but in what context are the users using the website? Are they on their mobile phones? 
Are they commuting? Are they at the beach? Are they relaxed? Are they sad? Are they under pressure? Um, these all come into play when you're creating different, all different types of webs websites, whether or not it's brochure websites or if it's e-commerce. Um, so yeah, very important contextual research. Um, stakeholder interviews. Um, basically, what I've been talking about is we should try and break these up into small workshops so that people aren't getting super tired and cranky and hungry. Um, and basically, yeah, they're long and tiring. If you can, feed your clients. Take them out to lunch. Get a few beers in them. Um, the stakeholders, they're the top dogs. Um, they will give you the best understanding of the business. Um, and they'll also be able to tell you after the website's gone live and what it means to them, a success and a failure. Um, so competitors, I've touched on it briefly. Um, basically, yeah, you want to benchmark the competitors. You want to know what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and what we can improve on. So, yeah, exactly what I said before. It's, it's really important. I mean, you need to know what competitors are doing. Um, usability testing. So there's three main forms of usability testing. Um, there's Gorilla, which is a <laughs> kind of commander. You go into the city and you say you've got an app that you want to test. You can go into the city and ask people to try it out. Or you can give them incentives, say, hey, I'll buy you a coffee if you try this out and tell me what you think. That's generally for small kind of budget clients. It's still valuable information. Um, but the problem with it is that if you're targeting random people, it's most likely not uh, a person that, like, they may or may not be using the product. Um, lab is uh, for hosting your own usability testing session. Um, so you would set up maybe a computer and a desk, invite people in, and they can use their product, uh, use the product and get their feedback on it, whether or not it's a rapid prototype. You can also give them um, sketches of pieces of paper and kind of walk them through how the app or the website's going to work. Um, and remote is pushing all of this hard work onto someone else and paying them for it. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, there's usability testing professionals where they will source clients that sh uh, should be your target market. Um, and then they'll host the usability sessions and then give their findings to you. Um, and seriously, if you have the budget and the time, it's a no-brainer to do this because it can save you a lot of headache in the future because without usability testing, you're basically using previous knowledge um, and a little bit of guesswork to give people a great experience. Um, analytics is an important one. Um, if they have it already installed on their current website, brilliant. You can see where things are falling down. Um, and they can really provide valuable insight into the human behavior, um, especially with e-commerce. E um, it's great for seeing if people, I guess, are leaving checkouts earlier, if they're abandoning them, and then you can try and figure out why they're doing that. Um, so personas. Um, personas are fictional characters. I'll just read this out. Personas are fictional characters created to represent the different user types that might use a site, brand, or product in a similar way. Um, and that, I mean, that explains it brilliantly. Uh, personas are all about trying to create fictional characters um, that could be potentially be using the product so that you can further try and get inside the user's head and figure out their user behaviors. Um, these, some of these uh, personas can contain the name, gender, age, the salary, key goals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and personas quite closely linked to user journeys. Um, Basically, user journeys help us understand the behavior of the user and how they're going to interact with the product. It's when you run through possible scenarios that you pick up forgotten functional requirements. Um, sorry to see a sip of water. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just go to the next slide where I've got a, a very s simple example. Um, so this is a user journey of someone who's forgotten their password. Uh, user clicks on forgot password link, user enters email address, the system then sends an email to reset their password, user clicks on reset link, provide an email, and then the user enters the new password field and submits the form. That's a very, very basic user journey, but if you apply this same principle to other types of journeys, 
you can figure out maybe what you've missed from the requirements stage or from a workshop and wait a minute. And so then you can say, wait a minute, we've missed this. And then you can go back to the client and figure out what's actually going on. It's actually very helpful for when you're doing complex e-commerce systems where maybe there's already existing customers, new customers, et cetera. Um, yeah, these are, these are great. Um, I'll touch on this briefly. Um, information architecture. Um, basically, you want to try and figure out what is the most valuable information to the client, um, to the user, sorry, and then make it easy for them to access it. Um, there's no point hiding. If, if it, say, say, for example, it's a site that really depends on generating inquiries. That's how they make their sales. Um, and if you hide that inquiry form, say in the footer or a little button, people aren't going to click it. Um, you need to make things obvious to the user. And it's, it just goes back to that point of providing the path of least resistance, just giving them what they want straight up rather than trying to jump through hurdles. So uh, this is where it gets a bit interesting. I know that was tough to get through, guys. But, it, yeah, but it's, um, it's essential. It really is. I mean, you have to do all of that planning before even thinking about wireframing. Um, so wireframing is incredibly useful for establishing that information hierarchy. So we can get a bit of a picture um, on how we want things to look, where we want them to be placed, what menu items we're going to have, how many, what's it going to look like once we respond down to mobile. Um, uh, and as well, it can be really useful to developers. Um, it gives them a bit of insight, especially if they're simple wireframes, gives them insight into think um, into maybe what blocks they need to create in, in Drupal, so maybe they can get a little bit of a head start. Maybe the designs are slightly lacking behind, and then they can get a really, really simple wireframe and know, OK, I'm going to have to create these regions. I'm going to have to create these contexts. I'm going to have to create these taxonomy terms, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and it's useful for finding and fixing flaws in the website. It's much cheaper to fix the problems now than when they creep up three months' time into dev. Um, that's when it gets expensive, and that's when projects can go over. So um, this is one type of uh, wireframing. Um, it's called sketching, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, these are for quick and dirty, um, getting a whole bunch of ideas onto a piece of paper, scribbling, erasing, and just trying to get as much elements onto the piece of paper as you can um, so that you can then refine these and then take them over to maybe a more polished wireframe. Um, yeah, basically, and also, if your sketching is good enough, you can show them to clients if you really want. You can show them maybe what they think. And this is a couple of sketches that I quickly did on the plane, just to give you an idea. You um, can see we've kind of got like a, we've got a uh, kind of about us brochure. Sorry, yeah? Just a question about this. Um, the level of detail here. Yeah. Yep. Do you have to like define this, what that detail, whatever details underneath? Like, is it just first name, last name, or is it just like more things like people help? You have the blocks, right? But what yep. about the detail? Yeah, great question. I mean, and that's sketching's perfect for just getting all the ideas onto the piece of paper. It doesn't need to go down into that kind of granularity. Maybe if you were showing a client, and if you weren't going to a more refined wireframe, then you would have to touch on those details. But this is for kind of fleshing out areas of content and blocks. Um, before moving on. It's a bit of a stepping stone, actually, I find. Um, and sometimes it can be quite hard to jump into like a wireframing tool without having any idea. And it's kind of good to refer to your sketches and just be like, oh, yeah, that's right. I am missing that Facebook block. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, this is another type of wireframing. It's called low fidelity. Um, once again, they're very, very quick. Um, they're great for low budgets. Um, maybe you need to get a quick fix right out the door. And these are great for just quickly mocking up something to give to a developer or to a designer. Um, and that's just kind of an example there. You can see we've got a header about us, context boss, a bit of a Twitter feed, and a footer. Very, very simple, very, very quick. Um, this is where it starts building up a bit more uh, information. So this is called grayscale fidelity. Basically use, you basically use your blacks, your grays, your whites to define regions and blocks and buttons. And you build a, up a little bit more um, detail. So we can kind of see here we've got a logo up in the top left corner. We're going to have a mobile button there. 
We've got a search input. We've got three buttons to the right over there. These are kind of what our product teasers are gonna look like. We know we're gonna need the title, the price. We wanna add them to the cart and maybe we wanna favorite them. It doesn't necessarily have to look like this. I mean, we might wanna put that star up in the top right corner. Um, yeah, once again, it's not as, because the next example is, is high fidelity. Um, and as you can see here, it is getting very close to lingering on the design. <laughs> um, so yeah, here we can see that we've introduced colors um, and there's a lot more detail now. So a designer can go to this and they can see, okay, this is exactly what we need and then they can work their magic on it. Um, it's still establishing all the places in the blocks um, and I know it looks very, very close to a design. Um, it's getting there. Um, but that's only because we've used a little bit of imagery and we've used a little bit of colors. I mean, if you were to apply those back to our grayscale wireframe, it would look very, very close. No. Um, so st the styling documentation um, should be covered in one of the previous workshops where maybe you talk a bit about the client branding. And then that's when, hopefully, they already have a style guide. If they don't and they're looking for a complete branding direction, then that's when we would then go to our designer, come up with a style guide, and then maybe then we can go into, once we've signed off on the wireframes and designs, we can start building an online style guide for the developers. But um, no, it's, it's not meant to be a design. The style guide Right, so a, a bit of a like a functional specs requirement, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely, I mean, that can be coupled with um, the wireframes. Um, it's kind of, it's not exactly part of, I guess, the user experience journey, which I'm trying to cover, cover in a lot of high level detail. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that you definitely wanna sit down with the developer and say, hey, we need these fields, we need these, and then come up with a um, functional document together. Um, but yeah, it's not exactly part of, I guess, the user experience journey. Yes, mate. Sorry, um, so you have this, you just mentioned that you're not going to apply like final design or branding on top of this wireframe, right? You're not even going to apply the design. If you're going to show this to client, is client going to say, like, why did you show this to me? Why are you not, like, it's not, it's not what I asked. This is not my design. How do you, how do you cope with that? Like, yeah, brilliant question. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it, you need to make it clear that it's not a design to the client. This is still going to design. Um, and yeah, this is where it does get a bit complicated. So um, it's very easy for them to confuse the design and then that's when you need to say, okay, so maybe high fidelity for a certain client probably is in the right direction. Maybe you wanna go grayscale or low for them. Um, but to other clients and especially to stakeholders, a high fidelity wireframe can really sell them on a concept um, because it kind of gives them a glimpse of that final product. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, it has happened before where you know, they mentioned like, okay, so for example, can that cleaning button there be green instead? And then that's when you have to reiterate. But most of the time, it's perfectly fine. They, they understand that it's still a wireframe. It just has a couple of colors applied to it for context. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yep, yep, definitely. Yeah, um, I talk about that a little bit in the bit. Um, and I mean, that's another point as well, is that it's very hard if you give a client a wireframe, it's hard for them to imagine what the final product could look like. Um, so it does require, it requires a lot less imagination from the client because they can kind of see it coming together as a website. Um, but yeah, definitely that is one of the cons. It is more time consuming, obviously. Um, prototyping is a great way of also showing the client um, what the final product could look like. Um, and especially when I talk about the tools that we can use, um, you can convert these high fidelity wireframes and be able to link between them and create a working prototype, which you could then use for usability testing. Um, so yeah, uh, prototyping is, I think, a big one, and definitely if you've got the budget, trying to squeeze it in. Um, so cool, so tools. Um, basically, yeah, there's different tools for different jobs. Um, if 
say if you're really good at Illustrator and you feel comfortable in Illustrator, then create your wireframes in Illustrator. Um, because uh, there's a program called Envision. And what Envision does is you can bring in those Illustrator files as different, different files and blocks, and you can create prototypes that way. Um, but then you have tools like Balsamic, where it's an inbuilt editor. Um, yeah, basically it's an inbuilt editor and prototyping and wireframing tool in one. And it also works on the cloud and also has a local, um, a local client. Um, UX Pin, that's the one that I uh, currently use. Um, it's, I, I think it's slightly better than Balsamic because Balsamic's still running on Flash, unfortunately. Um, so the performance isn't as good. Um, and yeah, it's Flash. <laughs> um, and also it has a height limit on the canvas due to the limitations of using Flash. So with uh, the emerging design trends now where there's a lot of long page websites, um, you can actually hit that canvas limit. It can be quite annoying. So then you're having to spread pages over multiple wireframes, which can be quite difficult to explain to the client. Um, but yeah, basically, yeah, these are, these are just a couple of the tools. There are heaps out there. Um, and I guess the only way to really find out which one you want to use is a lot of them are free and a lot of them provide great free trials. So just give it a go. If you don't like it, scrap it, move on to another one. Um, cool. So this little part here is just a kind of thing I call Drupal Smart Elements. Um, it's about saving time in the wireframing stage. So what you can do is you can create, uh, I guess, a library of commonly used blocks and you can reuse these across projects. So some of the standard things in Drupal, so the comments form or maybe the default login block, and then you can just drag those on from a library. Some tools give you, um, give you these libraries and then other times you're just gonna have to create your own library um, and manage it yourself. Um, and if you do use Balsamic, um, there's a great little pack um, which gives you all of these elements. So you can kind of reuse those and build a really, really quick Drupal site very quickly with those. So it does save you a bit of time. Yeah, mate. Uh, it, actually, yeah. Um, which one's that? Sorry. Mm. Um, Um, okay, so that wasn't Drupal, that was just a community pack created by someone in Balsamic using Balsamic elements. Um, but it's a great question and that kind of starts verging on the side of prototyping where do you use a tool out there that can convert your current wireframes into a prototype or do you just build it in straight static HTML? And it depends, I guess, on your UX designer and what they're comfortable with. Yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Um, cool, so basically it's not converting. We've sent this website live and it's not kind of working to what we thought it was gonna do. Um, basically for this, user validation is key. If you had done the usability testing in the first place and if you had gotten into the head of your users and, and just tried to give them the best user experience possible, um, then you can, can try and negate these issues. Um, but there are a few things you can do. Um, you can perform a post live usability review. Um, so you can see where it's falling down, use analytics to see where conversions are falling down. Um, and obviously it depends on the purpose of the website. Um, yeah. uh, and also if it's a small budget or if it's quite urgent, um, it's called quick wins. So you can see, you can break down different parts of what the problem is. So, so for example, um, uh, let's use Optus's example. That button is breaking on the mobile breakpoint. Um, you could, it probably doesn't need to be wireframed because they've already got a design in place. So what you can do as a quick win is you'd be able to quickly mock up what that button should look like, go into that breakpoint and fix it. And then hopefully then that would then increase conversions because now they can click the button. Amazing concept. Um, and yeah, testing and evaluating, it's really important. I mean, once the website goes live, 
um, your job isn't done. I mean, there's still ongoing improvements as you go. Um, one of which is called A-B testing. Um, this is great if you're not quite sure if an idea is um, going to work or not. So what you can do is you can serve maybe 50% of the clients, I'm sorry, the users, <clears throat> uh, this particular block, and then serve 50% of clients this particular block, and see which one works better. Um, there's a great tool called Visual Website Optimizer um, that can do all this, and you can actually do it inside the program, and it just inserts a bit of JavaScript so you don't have to go back to dev and implement this. Um, and there's also a great, um, a great little website called Witch Test One. And um, if you subscribe with your email address, um, they once a month will send you a usability, usability tests that they've performed. And what you can do is um, they'll ask you, okay, which one do you think won? You select your answer and then you can see a poll of results. So you can see what other UX designers thought was going to win. And a lot of the time it isn't what you thought. Um, but that's a great website. It's a really, really good resource. Um, there's different ways we can measure results. Um, so it's quite hard to figure out if it is working. I mean, you can look at inquiries, and maybe if it's an e-commerce store, you can look at sales. But you want to look at analytics, um, making sure that the inquiries are coming up. Um, yeah, that's basically it. That's for yeah measuring. Um, and also a vital one is getting the client and user feedback post live. So um, whether it's through the use of a, uh, of a poll or a form, um, just trying to get feedback from your users and see what they think of the new website. Cool. Um, so I've got a bit of a case study for you. Um, this is a website that we do call The Goods. Um, and basically, they're a business to business seller of products in cleaning, catering, washing, and safety. Um, so they're e commerce, but it's more of a, I know it's hard to describe. It's not your traditional, yeah, it's B2B. It's not your traditional e commerce store. Um, so that's the current site. A little bit dated. Um, it did the job for a long time, <clears throat> but it's, it's time to upgrade. So, um, so, <clears throat> so these are the three workshops that we hosted with the client beforehand. We had the kickoff and stakeholder meeting as a combined um, for roughly around three hours. Um, that we then dedicated an entire day <clears throat> to gathering requirements. Um, so they came in the morning. We talked through different business requirements, different functionality, went to lunch, came back, and then continued working on it. Um, and then workshop three, we presented them with some wireframes and a small prototype after, after gathering all that information. Um, and obviously, you're still talking to the client between these workshops. It's not like, OK, see you in two weeks. Um, you're still communicating with them. But um, yeah, that's, just, that's how we laid it out, this project. Yes. Yeah. 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 You you generally in the workshop and as well um, the project manager that would be managing that project, so they're on top of it from the very beginning. Um, so this is just a little example of us working in our breakout room, um, and this was great. So we were sitting on the couches here. You can see a little glimpse of me to the left there, so to the right there, um, and we were just on the on the chalkboard just sketching out the entire process for new customers signing up and existing customers logging in. Um, so yeah, that was a really great way of doing it. I mean, if you've got a chalkboard like this or a whiteboard, great. Another way you can do it is post-it notes on a big boardroom table. Um, but yeah, it's great because you've got the clients sitting there and you can kind of work with them. They can go up and draw on it as well. Um, so before I move on to that, I'll just show you a. Um, I'll just show you a quick. Let me just exit this. Um, so this is our UX pin. This is one of the tools I was talking about. Um, and as we can see here, it's actually exported um, a HTML version. Um, so what we can do is it exports a little sitemap for you. So when you're running through the client, you can kind of go through all your different wireframes in the sitemap. Or you can go a step further, and then you can link certain elements to different wireframes so you can make it feel like it's a bit of a prototype, a bit of a working website. 
Um, and what made this website really interesting is that um, it needed to be really easy for people to be able to go to products, but then it's also just as vital to be able to check out their account information because it's in the account section where um, we sell products that they've previously purchased because it's important to realize that with this particular company, um, being B2B, they have recurring customers um, and recurring sales. So maybe, for example, once a month, this restaurant knows it needs a 1,000 napkins. And so they, they know they can go to that one place and they can reorder it again. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of an example. So I've hooked up that products button to the products page. Um, and then now we've got the products sidebar on the left there. And these are the three main, uh, sorry, the four main categories of their website. And I've just got an example of catering being expanded and we're searching for some cups that are hot. And yeah, this was all done within UX pin. Um, and then I've also got what the products menu is going to look like on um, on iPhone or mobile, and also what the admin menu is going to look like on mobile as well. And the great thing as well about um, let me just find it for you. Two seconds. Um, here we go. So this is an example of the landing logged in page. And right now we're on the um, iPhone breakpoint. So this gives them a really great idea of what the page could look like on mobile. And then we can quite easily flick back to desktop. And so you can do this with them. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just a really great and clear way of showing them um, how the website works. Um, and as well, so then now if we're on a product, we can click through to a product. And so they can kind of see, it's a Magento site, by the way. So, sorry, Drupal Commerce. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, as you can see, it's, it's actually, it's a brilliant program. Um, the only problem with it is that it's quite young and it suffers from a pretty terrible memory leak. So you have to close Chrome a couple of times during the day. But apart from that, it's brilliant. Um, it's the best one that I've found where it um, combines everything you need into one tool. It's got your editor, it's got your wireframe, it's got your prototyping, it's in the cloud. It's easy to manage with different staff members. Different staff members can collaborate on it as well. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's, one thing, I haven't been able to find another tool that be, can do all of those things in the one tool. Yes? Sorry, um, you mentioned the scan feature. Yeah. Um, is there any sort of... So UXPIN has the editor built in. Yeah, 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 but I think it's like an interface. Like, it's like not gonna, are you going to be able to suddenly use that uh, in the business, like, I need a trigger or... Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, I'm just trying to think because there is actually uh, for <laughs> Sketch on Mac, there is a plugin for UX Pin, and so you can take um, different elements across. Um, but as far as I think, I think well, I mean, in in our case, our designer he prefers we print them out on big gigantic sheets of A3 for him, and he loves us sitting there, kind of sketching on them and just starting a fresh PSD. Um, but definitely, um, if you do use Sketch, there is a plugin to allow you to easily bring those across. Yes, mate. Definitely, yeah. You said it's all about the path of least resistance. Yep. And I come across a lot of clients who they want what's cool, but they don't want what's actually functional. And you're like, you know, I speak to my mom and she's like, I hate these websites because, you know, you do this and this stuff animates and this stuff jumps out. Yeah. All this bullshit happens and she, she just wants to buy something. Yep. So how do you separate that in UX? Like, can you... Definitely. Um, it's... You know, it's quite easy to kind of jump on the bandwagon of hamburger buttons just because they look cool. Um, and I do agree with you um, in, some, in some circumstances where 
if you've got a widescreen device, I mean, say the average, you know, 1920 wide on a HD monitor, um, why would you hide them when you can show them? And the difference between, and that's why, it's, it's part of the reason why I chose this case study, is that um, it was very difficult to be able to manage um, both being able to easily access products, um, but also being able to easily access um, your landing logged in page. Because for the product, while the products page is important, it's not as important as that landing page, which I'll just bring up. Because because they are B2B, this is why it's um, quite important that they land on this page because a lot of them are gonna go, okay, that was my last order. I want everything in that order again, and I'm gonna click reorder. Definitely, yeah, that's why, yeah. And as well, that's part of the reason why as well that this, um, the account kind of managing section is um, in the top right corner. It's a very, very easy and recognizable place where you can just go to and you know it's always gonna be there. Um, so yeah, that was my understanding of it. And so far we've had some pretty positive feedback with it. Um, and it was, sorry, I'll get to you in a second. Um, and it was quite lucky because um, our, receptionist, she does exactly this. She, say, once every couple of months needs to restock stationery. And so we gave her the prototype. And I mean, you know, she's not a web developer. She's just, she's just a receptionist. Not, she's you know, the perfect target market. No, that sounded badly, <laughs> didn't it? Uh-oh. No, um, no, that sounded badly. Um, she's, she was the perfect target market. I mean, that's one big segment of three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a good justification. Yeah, awesome. There's loads of people don't justify that. Oh, it looks cool. Yeah, it looks cool. <laughs> Medium does it. Like, yeah, so. yeah. Great looking website, but. Medium yeah. Um, so we've got three minutes left. I'm almost at the end. I just want to maybe see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions from you guys because the person who gave the best question today gets cool. one of these Whoa. guys. Yeah. Whoa. Check it out. Pretty cool. <laughs> Sorry, yes, mate. Can you come back to the screen as well, please? Yep. Uh, to the, uh, the tab, the, the tab there, actually. The right side. Yep. Um, on the right side, can you just go to the right side, please? Yep. You see how you have this um, menu? Mm -hmm. But it's always hidden. Just from your experience, is it a good idea to duplicate that somehow within the page itself? The, the side menu? Like in voice and balance? Or, like having a duplication somewhere in the footer or in some of those items in the page. Yep. Um, to be honest, I did uh, flirt with the idea as well of it um, coming over the top of the page. So it, so it's, it's so that sidebar doesn't appear when you're on the accounts page. So it, it could appear on any page. So you click that, you get the slider, and then you can choose to go to your account manager. But I think it was just a better user experience just taking them directly to this page. They can just go top right corner, click it, and they're there. Um, what if they don't know what it is, though? Because usually what you see behind this you know, avatar of, of the guy, the girl, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is a, a login, a yep. logout, and maybe my account. But what about the invoices and orders? Wouldn't you just expose them as a separate so it's possible to be able to view your orders on this page. So we've got our previous orders there, and you'd be able to click on previous orders to go to a full list of them. Um, but, but, but sorry, that's exactly what I'm saying. On that table at the bottom, right? Um, why don't you just put like invoices, a duplication of some of the items on the right side in the related blocks, like this previous order? Uh, like a, yeah, like an invoice button or anything that relates to this accounting page. Um, there are times where I'll duplicate things so that you can get to the same point from multiple different yeah. positions. And as an example, the uh, pull up your credit balance just on the client there. Mm. So that's a, and that's a link for a good balance on the home menu. Yeah. Yeah, just say this, this page doesn't need these three as well. We said we've already acquired the user as a main customer. Mm. We assume that user had um, had the user website before, before that gets um, what they're using as opposed to yeah. a retail client, which I agree with. Um, cool. Um, all right, so I'll just quickly wrap this up, guys. Um, I've got a couple of resources there that I love. 
Um, Smashing Magazine, Smashing UX Design is a great book. Um, UX Pin release free PDFs about once every two months. Um, they're great as well. Um, how to get people to sorry. How to people how to get people to do stuff by Susan M. Weinshank. She's a doctor um, who studied psychology and then decided to get into web design. <laughs> so she talks a little bit about the morality of um, kind of tricking users into gain more sales, and it's a really interesting read. Um, stuff that there's too many to list. Email, tweet me, and we can swap resources. Um, I'm in Melbourne until March 15th, so if you want to have a drink and discuss and pick my brain more, um, let's do it. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Cheers.